In this video, we will be discussing the importance of optimizing WebGL content for performance. As a developer with over 5 years of experience in 3GS and React 3 Fiber, I have come across many challenges when it comes to creating experiences that run smoothly on many devices. Despite how important this topic is, performance optimization is often overlooked in tutorials, leaving developers and 3D artists to fend for themselves. That's why I have created this comprehensive guide to help you understand how to create beautiful but well-optimized experiences that will run seamlessly on most devices. In this video, we will first talk about what's generally heavy in WebGL and how to track performances. Then we will go over different basic concepts like draw calls, materials, texture, shadows, and post-processing. Finally, we will analyze two websites and see what optimization techniques they used. In order to optimize 3GS content, we need to understand what's heavy or not. Is it the amount of polygons, the type of material you're using, the size of your textures, or the number of animations? 3D artists are often asking those questions to developers. There is no definitive answer to these questions. What's important is understanding the trade-off between visual quality and performance. Think of each element, such as polygon count, materials, and textures as little sliders that you can adjust according your project's needs. For example, if you want to increase the polygon count of your 3D models, you might need to reduce the amount of animations or give up your fancy shadows. Before starting a project, it's essential to decide what's important for your project's success. By identifying your project priorities, you can make informed decisions on how to allocate your resources. Tracking performance metrics is crucial for optimizing your WebGL content effectively. By keeping an eye on memory usage, the number of draw calls, and the frame rate of your application, you can identify any issues that may cause memory leaks or make your content too heavy to run on lower-end devices. One helpful tool for monitoring performance metrics is stat.js. You may have seen this little panel in the top left corner of most 3GS examples. When you click on it, you cycle through the frame rate of your application, the allocated memory in megabytes, and the milliseconds needed to render one frame. If you're using React 3 Fiber, you can use R3FPerf plugin, which has a little more detailed information like the number of polygons, texture, etc. Another approach to track performance metrics is to use the performance monitor of your operating system. This provides a better understanding of the graphical load on the device you're testing. I recommend using both methods to gain a comprehensive understanding of your content's performance. There is no such thing as too many metrics when it comes to performance optimization. Draw calls is the first metric you should be looking at. They represent the number of objects the GPU has to render every frame. To understand draw calls better, let's break down how they are calculated. Let's start with two meshes made of a box geometry and a physical material. This will create two draw calls, one per box. Now, if we add a light and enable shadows for both boxes, we have four draw calls, the two we had before, plus two more for the shadow of the white box and the shadow of the orange one. If we make the material of the orange box transmissive, the number of draw calls is multiplied by two, which results in eight draw calls. By adding a transmissive material to your scene, it doubles the total amount of draw calls. Finally, enabling a post-processing effect like Bloom, we will end up with 16 draw calls because when enabling post-processing effects, the entire scene is rendered twice. In reality, what you see on screen now has something like 32 draw calls because the Bloom effect has a draw call base cost of 12 draw calls and there's also a background image that costs one draw call. This was just an example to illustrate how draw calls are calculated for meshes. As you can see, depending on the setting of your scene, our two simple meshes started with only two draw calls and ended up creating 16 draw calls. It's important to note that things like shadows, transmissive materials, or post-processing can double the number of draw calls for a mesh, making them expensive in terms of performance. To reduce draw calls, one approach is to merge multiple objects into a single object. This can be achieved by merging the meshes programmatically or in your 3D software or using instancing. However, there are some trade-offs to consider. Merging objects mean that you can only use a single material for both objects, 
and you also won't be able to animate them separately. Instancing can be used to animate instanced mesh using shader coding, but this is a more advanced technique. It's also crucial to keep in mind that merging objects to reduce draw calls can cause you to lose the performance gain of frustrum calling. When many objects are merged together, the renderer must render the entire object, even if only a small portion of it is visible to the camera. Therefore, it's essential to balance the benefits of reducing draw calls with the performance cost of rendering unnecessary content. Next, let's talk about material practices and some do and don't. Materials and texturing is a very wide topic. In the lesson, I am only going to scratch the surface and talk about the workflow I use in most projects. At the beginning of my 3GS journey, I use the mesh basic materials quite often because when you are not a material expert, it's an easy workflow. 3D artists can bake all the lighting and shadows into one texture that you can connect to the map of your basic material. You don't need to deal with lighting and what you see in your 3D software will be very close to what you'll get in your 3GS scene. It's a very lightweight and fast shader, but baking everything in one texture and keeping a good quality usually require larger texture files. Over the years, I almost fully transitioned to using physically based rendering, PBR for short, using mesh physical material. It's a heavier material, but offers advantages such as an easier transition from 3D software to 3GS integration, as well as being well supported by the GLTF standard. There's a very good guide on the Blender documentation about PBR workflow and how to connect all your nodes correctly. If you follow this guide, you can export your models in GLTF, import them in your 3GS scene, and normally all the values set in Blender should be well translated to 3GS. Transparent materials can be heavy and have weird behavior when moving the camera around or having multiple layers of transparent objects. It's best to avoid them if possible. If you must use them, try to see if you can achieve your desired result with an alpha map and the alpha test property. Another alternative is using mesh transmission material, a better alternative with more option for transparent object recently released by the React3 Fiber team. Finally, let's talk a little bit about UV, as it will be a good bridge onto our next topic. 3GS materials can use two sets of UVs. The second set is used for AO and light maps, and the first one for all the other maps. Having two sets of UV is useful for tiling. Tiling is a technique to reduce your texture size by repeating a seamless image in the X and Y direction. So for example, you can have a very small repeating diffuse and normal maps on UV1 and an AO map that doesn't repeat for your shadows. In my opinion, textures have the most important role. They are the thing that contribute the most to the overall quality, but they are also the thing you have to be the most careful about when thinking about performance. Like I did with materials, I just want to go over a few concepts that will help you understand better how to optimize your scenes. Color palettes are a useful optimization technique that allows you to use a single material for all your object by simply moving the UV of the object to the corresponding color square you created. This technique offers a great compromise between quality and performance. ORM, occlusion roughness metalness textures are commonly used in the PBR workflow. By combining these three textures into a single image, you can optimize the texture usage without sacrificing quality. Tools like Substance Painter allow you to export ORM textures directly, making it a convenient tool for this technique. The color palette system can also be used for the roughness and metalness channels. However, if you use the color palette, you need a separate ambient occlusion map. Environment maps are textures that reflective materials like plastic or metal can reflect on, and they can also be used to light up your objects. Environment maps offer a more realistic lighting option than traditional directional or ambient light sources, and they are relatively cheap performance-wise. HDR, EXR, or JPG images can be used for environment maps. HDR and EXR will provide more realistic lighting results. A common practice is using a JPEG, or often called an LDR image, with a good resolution for the background, and an HDR with a small resolution for the environment map. Textures in 3GS should always be in power of 2 and have equal width and height. 
for example, 1024 by 1024 pixels, also referred as 1K texture. Polygons and materials count affect CPU and GPU 3D computation power, but when optimizing textures, you want to keep an eye on your GPU memory or VRAM consumption. Avoid using textures bigger than 2K and split your textures in two if they are too big. Basis is another very light file format you can consider, but in my experience, it is currently a quite complicated workflow since traditional tools like Photoshop don't support basis format yet. Shadows can be something quite expensive but also vital for the realism of your scenes. Dynamic shadows are the most expensive and should be avoided whenever possible. Imagine how expensive it is for the renderer to calculate and create a texture for your shadow every frame. If you absolutely need dynamic shadows, use a small shadow map resolution to minimize the performance impact. If you're on a very tight performance budget, instead of using dynamic shadows, consider using fake generic shadow under moving objects. Even for a moving character, having a texture-based circular gradient following him is very cheap and can do the trick in a low poly style project. In most cases, you would use some sort of baked shadows. Baked shadows can be created in a 3D software using light maps, AO map, or simply combined onto your diffuse texture. You can also generate them at runtime directly in 3GS. Very often, your scene should have a mix of static and dynamic shadows for moving objects. When it comes to rendering scenes in 3GS, post-processing can significantly enhance the final output, adding visual effects like depth of field, motion blur, and bloom. However, it's important to weigh the benefits against the cost of using post-processing as it can have a significant impact on performance. As mentioned earlier, adding a post-processing pass to your render pipeline will double the amount of draw calls, which can be taxing on low-end devices. In general, it's a good idea to avoid using post-processing unless it's absolutely necessary for the project. If you find yourself with some extra room in the performance budget, adding a bloom effect can add some very nice visual flair to your scene. I want to summarize what we have learned so far through two case studies, a website that are, in my opinion, well optimized. It's also two very different websites with different requirements. On the left, we have a fairly large low poly world made by Mercy Michel, and on the right side, a highly realistic car configurator made by Viz Circle. I think that reverse engineering other website is one of the best way to learn what others do and how you can apply these techniques in your own project. I believe though that the know-how of a company should be somewhat protected, so I'm not gonna talk about things that was not already shared publicly by those companies. If you want to investigate more, you should do your own research and never copy or steal someone else's work. That being said, let's dive into the first project. In the Colts Club project, you're controlling a character in third-person view in a large virtual world with a lot of objects and animations. When I see a large world like this one, my two main concerns will be the amount of draw call and the texture size. If you read their case study, you can see that merging and instancing object was one of the biggest worry. If you look at the overall view of the map, they ended up merging meshes into eight groups. Why are you making groups, you may ask? Well, there are two reasons they don't merge all the meshes into only one single big object. One, the AO map size for the entire map would have to be something like 8,000 pixels large. And as we have seen earlier, we want to avoid having very large image file because of the loading time and the VRAM usage. Instead, you better split these big 8K textures into eight smaller ones like 1,024 pixels. Splitting textures also enables the possibility to load them asynchronously. For example, there is no need to load the texture of a zone if the user never visits it. Two, like I explained earlier, the downside of having a single big merged mesh is that you won't be able to leverage the first term calling system of the camera, meaning all the polygons will be rendered at all time no matter where we are in the scene. They explained that they considered using instancing for the object that repeat a lot like the trees and the cars, but given the amount of different objects they had, it would be yet too many instance meshes, therefore too many draw calls. Following your initial intuition might not always be the best solution. At the end of the day, you have to try several methods, and the numbers will tell you what's best. As you can see, they are also using a color palette, 
to give objects different shades of colors, even if all the meshes are merged into a single big object. The last thing I thought was interesting in their case study are the shadows. As we discussed earlier, it's better to avoid dynamic rendered shadows and use back shadow texture for your static objects. So you might think that, of course, in this big map, baking your shadows will be the best method. But in this case, the world is too large and baking shadows would actually create a lot of additional textures. So what they did is using a directional light that followed the character and cast shadows around him with a reasonable shadow map size. They went the extra mile by modifying some shadow code to make the shadow map fade away instead of being cut suddenly for a more pleasing visual experience. The second project is a very different project and has a very different workflow from the one we've seen before. In a project like this one, the polygon count will be an important chunk of the performance budget. There is no way around it. A car needs a high amount of polygons. A model like this, exterior plus the interior, is minimum 3 to 400,000 polygons. So it is important to care a lot about the texturing to keep a well-optimized experience. I must say, it is very impressive to see how they managed to keep the texture dimension and file size to a minimum. By using a combination of colors and ORM palettes with seamless repeating textures, the total texture file size is around 10 megabyte. This experience is so well optimized that they are even using post-processing. They have a bloom effect for the lights and a temporal anti-aliasing system. You can see when the camera stop moving, they render a few additional frames for a better quality. It even appears that they use some sort of real-time ambient occlusion for the shadows. You can see when I open the doors, the shadows are rendered in real time. Personally, I find it a bit surprising because if I had to make this project, I would probably go for a static AO map. Real-time AO is very expensive and the quality isn't always very good. In this example, with a static AO, the only thing you'd be missing are these little shadows when we open the door. I'm not gonna lie, it's a very nice touch, but it's an expensive one for what it's worth. Reading project case study and analyzing what other websites have done is the best way to discover and understand best practices. I hope that in this short video, I have given you enough tools to keep exploring and finding better ways to optimize your next 3GS project. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.